you have cancer. Three words that change a life forever. We would like to offer another three words. Be an overcomer. Welcome to the 1% Podcast, where our conversations with other cancer warriors, survivors, and caregivers allows us to give you that extra boost you need to face your challenge head on, live life from a new perspective, and forge a path that keeps you moving free and clear. Now, welcome your host and cancer survivor, Truett Taylor. Welcome, everyone, to the 19th episode of the 1% Podcast, the show where we dig deep with cancer warriors, caregivers, and survivors in order to give you that 1% you need to keep pushing forward. Today on the show, we have Fabi Powell. Fabi is the widow of Josh Powell, and she has created the Josh Powell Foundation in honor of her late husband, First Lieutenant William Joshua Powell. Uh, Josh was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer called synovial sarcoma in his lower abdomen. The cancer took his life two years and 25 days later, just one month after he married the love of his life. And Fabi has made her mission to create a legacy in honor of Josh using his story and vision to motivate and encourage others battling sarcoma cancer. So, oh, everyone, why don't you welcome Miss Fabi to our show today. Fabi, how are you doing? Hi, guys. I am doing great. Happy to be here. Happy to share my story. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I've been noticing a lot of attention around your foundation and we have a mutual friend that connected us together. And so I dug into your story about Josh and I was just blown away with how much inspiration I would say I would got from what you've, what you've done so far and being able to carry on this legacy and inspire so many people and your, everything from your stadium tours to the Powell packs to all the donations and stuff you've received. I think it just takes a tremendous amount of effort and passion to do what you're doing. So it's an honor for me to be talking to you this morning and looking forward to sharing your story and Josh's story with all of our listeners. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, it's an honor to be here. Josh would be really, really proud. So first question I'd like to ask everyone on the show, and I'll ask you this as well too, just because it's part of your story, but why do you feel like it's important for you to be able to share Josh's story with everyone? um, Well, First off, Josh was the most inspiring individual I have I've ever met, which is why I moved halfway across the country to give our love a chance, really. Um, just watching him go through the different phases of being diagnosed with cancer, starting treatment, having multiple setbacks, potentially facing a leg amputation that would forever change his life. And there was just one constant always with Josh. And to be honest, this actually started far before he was ever diagnosed with cancer. He just always remained positive, no matter what curveball was thrown his way. He always had a positive attitude. He always had such a strong mindset. And that's something that he fiercely believed in and it was contagious you know he never felt sorry for himself and because he made the choice to choose resilience in the face of adversity versus being a victim or you know using it as an excuse to stop living stop dreaming stop hoping he just did the exact opposite he let it propel him into things that maybe he wouldn't have done if he wasn't diagnosed with cancer. And because of that, it made me realize just how important it is to empower the mindset, the minds of these newly diagnosed cancer patients so that they have the appropriate tools to be be able to get through their battle. And that's regardless of what the outcome looks like. And that's just true with any individual in life, because none of us are promised tomorrow. You know, some of us know that our time may be cut shorter than we wanted because of maybe a cancer diagnosis or other factors in life, but we can all really learn from Josh in the way that he chose to live his life. I know I have tremendously, and I thought that it would be a selfish thing for me just to kind of to take that with me and me only. I I knew that after Josh passed away that this legacy needed to be created because I knew that it could help thousands of people. And then by providing this mindset to 
newly diagnosed cancer patients, then they also have the opportunity to inspire other people. And I think there's nothing better than having the peace of mind, knowing that you could be leaving this world, but knowing that you made an impact and you left a mark because for me, like that's what being here is all about. I couldn't agree more. And so with your story, is there one thing specifically, maybe there's a, um, someone listening on the show right now who's a, who's a caregiver of someone who has cancer or I know you're going to walk us through that journey of what it's like to actually go from the beginning, from where you guys met all the way until the end. Yeah. And is there a certain piece of advice that you have specifically for that person that's listening today that maybe is on the verge of losing a loved one or is just walking through the battle with someone? Yeah, definitely. Um, never lose hope. That's the biggest thing. Um, Josh told me this numerous times while we were battling cancer together, because truthfully you are, you're doing it together and it's hard in different ways for the different pieces that are involved. And I think it's easy as a caregiver sometimes to hear the words of your medical providers and all you hear is this person that I love, like doesn't have a lot of time left, but don't get stuck in that news because the truth is, and Josh said this so well, he wrote a note in um, his cell phone and I had read it after he passed away. And well, there was two notes specifically that stood out to me. One was miracles happen every day. Why not me? And it's true. I mean, you hear stories about miracles happening. I wish we heard them more often, but usually on the news, it's just negative stuff, but they do, they happen every single day. And, it, and why not you? It could happen to any of us. So I think that mentality is what helped Josh hold on for so long. And two, as his caregiver, we never talked about Josh dying. We never talked about like, oh, well, one day when you're not here or like, what should I do as your caregiver after you pass away? Like, we, we never even threw that out there as an option. And what that allowed us to do, and that may not be right for everybody, but it was right for us. And it was right for Josh. Josh didn't want to know specific details about his cancer after it metastasized. He didn't want to know all the different locations it was in because I think he feared that it would kind of mess with his, his mindset. And that's what kept him so strong for so long. So me as the caregiver, I did, I did want to know the details. I didn't want to know what we were up against so that I could prepare myself for the worst case scenario. And that worked for us. So I think just being in tune with what works for you, but also never losing hope because the other thing that I read in Josh's phone that broke my heart was that he had written an excerpt just on a random day saying, I think I finally have everybody on board with me beating this. I think I finally have like my family on the same page as me. Like, I think they're finally believing that there's a chance that I can beat this. And it breaks my heart because I can't even imagine being the person going through cancer and giving everything that you have every single day to try and beat this thing that's slowly killing you. And to feel like your loved ones just have given up hope and feeling like you have to somehow get them on board with the same mindset that you have. It's exhausting. So with newly diagnosed cancer patients and their loved ones that I come across, I try and share that story with them and just remind them no matter how hard or bad or, um, you know, whatever the prognosis ends up being, I think you just always have to hold, hold on to hope because the truth is if you have air in your lungs and you're breathing, there's a chance, you know, and if your doctors have a plan A, a plan B and a plan C and so on and so forth, then there's a chance there's hope and there's new treatments that come out every single day. So just never losing hope is the biggest thing. You have to be strong and you just have to believe that things are going to work out the way that they're supposed to. And as long as you stay positive, your outcome is going to be strong no matter what it looks like. I love that. That's it's it's really not over until that last last breath is gone. 
Right. And yeah, so there's so much that can happen just off hope and just, you know, just off faith and believing that there's, there could possibly be something else, be something yeah. else happening. And I had someone on recently and she and I were talking about um, cancer and, you know, some people get pardoned on earth and some people get pardoned in heaven kind of thing. But, you know, eventually one day that, you know, we don't have to suffer for this anymore uh, right. with this anymore. And right. um, so it's, it's one of those things where if it happens while we're alive, like then, then that's great. If it doesn't, you know, and if it happens after that, then that's, then, then, then the suffering's gone. So, okay. but holding on to that very last minute, I think is, is, is so true. Um, so I want to shift gears into something. To, I was, I've read your story. And for people who don't know you guys' story, yeah. you guys met in a Broadway, off-Broadway in <laughs> downtown Nashville. Yes. Where, if you haven't been to Nashville before, it's, it's kind of... Um, it's a little bit of chaos. A little bit of chaos, I would say. Um, tons of good music, tons of good food, tons of people. Everybody's there to have a great time, I would say, especially off-Broadway. Yes. And, um, so you know, you guys met and you said that you fell in love instantly and stuff. So I want to talk about that for a second, just because it kind of leads into everything that you guys have experienced so far. Yeah. Yeah. Would you you say that, you know, it was kind of a love at first sight kind of thing or or what, what happened that first day? Yeah, it was very strange, but in like the best, the best way. Um, I had gone to the Titans Cowboys football game with my girlfriends and it was our last day in Nashville. We had been here for four days prior. We actually flew out here on Josh's birthday. So hindsight, that was really crazy. Um, which is nine 11, which was also very scary (laughs) to fly out on nine 11. But, um, no. So I was sitting, it was in the afternoon, so it wasn't too chaotic. It wasn't like everybody in the bar was like completely smashed, but I was sitting at the bar with my girlfriends. Um, We had just ordered lunch and Josh and his buddies walked in and I'm nearsighted. And for some reason, I just refused to wear contacts. So if I'm not wearing my glasses, I can't see very well. So I asked my girlfriend, I was like, hey, is that guy cute? Because sometimes it's like he could either be like super attractive or he's like 80 years old and completely inappropriate for me (laughs) asking if he's attractive. So um, in this case, they agreed, and I'm like, he keeps looking over at me, like maybe there's a thing, who knows? So he walks over to go wait in line to go to the restroom, and it's right across from where I'm sitting. And he looks over again, and he has like this infectious smile. Like if you go to the website and you see a picture of him when he was really healthy, I mean, his smile never changed, but he has these like smile lines that are just perfection, and like the sparkle in his eye, like your typical like attractive, charming football player. I'm like, Oh my God, who is this guy? He's trouble. But I smiled back at him and he like did one of those things where he turned around to make sure that I wasn't like looking at someone else. (laughs) I thought that was pretty funny. And so I started laughing at him and I was like, just gestured for him to come over after he was done. And he did. And it was just weird. Like it wasn't like, your typical love at first sight moment that you think of where you're like, Oh my God, I'm infatuated with this person. Like that person's going to be my husband type of thing. I just knew that I wanted, wanted to talk to him. Like I was drawn to him and I could tell that he felt the same way. And just right off the bat, it was like the least awkward first meeting ever. And we just had this like witty banter from the get go. I think the first question I asked him was like, who does your eyebrows? Cause that's the industry that I'm in. I'm, <laughs> I'm a medical esthetician and I like do people's eyebrows <laughs> and he had really good eyebrows, but I could tell like he took care of him himself, but he was like a country boy who played football for army. And I'm like, and he takes care of himself. Like you're an anomaly. Like, I don't really understand you, <laughs> but he was like, I don't, nobody does my eyebrows and he'll deny it till forever. But I've done his eyebrows. He cleans them up for sure. But <laughs> that was that was our first conversation and then I think I told him I was joking around there was this like YouTube video out that was explaining that usually really really pretty girls are crazy but then there's once in a lifetime they did like the mathematics of it like once in a lifetime you come across a unicorn who like has a heart of gold is funny like has all has all the qualities but you're also like look at her and you think that she's really pretty 
And so I was just being a brat and I was joking around with him telling him I was a unicorn. (laughs) And I forced him out on the dance floor. I was a former ballerina and I loved dancing and he was being super shy, but he had this, (laughs) I think he was like playing tricks on me because he had me thinking that he was like this really shy guy who like never got girls. And so by the end of the day, I was telling him like, giving him girl advice as if he needed it. I'm like, you should always go after the girl in the bar, wherever you are that you think is out of your league because you're amazing and any girl would be lucky to be with you. And I was just like prefacing this because I figured I'd never see him again. So I'm like, at least I'm going to give him the confidence that he needs to like get the girl that he deserves. Little did I know Josh has like so much game can get any girl that he ever wanted (laughs) and he needed zero help. So it was pretty funny looking back after getting to know him that I was like giving him girl advice the entire time we were together the first day. But fast forward, he ends up leaving. He has work early in the morning. He lives um, up in Clarksville, which is an hour away because he's stationed at Fort Campbell at this time. And actually he didn't tell me he was in the army the first day we met. I think he thought it was going to scare me away, which it wouldn't have, but um, he told me that later. So then I thought he was a liar. And then I'm like, you told me you worked in logistics. What do you, what's Fort Campbell? <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, I went back to California the next day and he had sent me a text like, I don't want this to be the last time I see you. Like I've never met anybody like you before. And it just makes me sad that you're leaving. Like, I don't, I don't want this to end. And I'm like, well, you know, at least we didn't have an opportunity to screw this up. First meeting was the best one. Let's leave it at that. And um, went home and the rest was history. We just started FaceTiming every single day and slowly getting to know each other. And fast forward two months and Josh calls me and tells me he just got diagnosed with cancer. So that was pretty wild. Definitely a curveball. Um, my ex-boyfriend of three years prior to that, his mom actually got diagnosed with breast cancer towards the end of our relationship. And then I broke up with him and she and I ended up staying really close. So lucky for me, um, I knew what a cancer diagnosis could potentially look like. I knew, you know, the process of chemo and losing your hair and just the emotional roller coaster that a cancer diagnosis puts on somebody. And I realized early on that I, if there's a person built to deal with that, it was me. I just, I have that natural like caretaker gene, I guess you could say. And I think he was expecting me to run. To be honest, he gave me the out. He said, you know, if this is something that you don't feel like is something that should be part of your future or like just not the ideal situation that you were hoping it would be. Like, I totally understand. I'll let you go about your life and would never think anything bad of you, or I would never think you're a bad person for not staying, you know, which I think was a very kind thing to do to give me the out. But I just told him like, without even hesitating, I was like, listen, I already love you. And that's not something that's going away. So you're not getting rid of me that easily. You know, I'm sticking around until it doesn't make sense to, you know, I know this is new, but this is something special and something that I'm willing to take a risk on. So we met in September In March, I moved to Nashville. I left my five-year career there, my family, my friends, and just didn't look back. It was the right thing to do. I knew it in my heart. I knew it in the depths of my soul that Josh was somebody that I was supposed to risk it all for. And I knew too that he deserved somebody who was going to love him unconditionally during the hardest days of his life, you know, and hardest years of his life. And I knew that I could be that person for him. So we took the pressure off by saying, I'm moving to Nashville. I'm getting my own apartment we'll see if this works. If it doesn't work, I'm still going to stay in Nashville. So don't feel like I'm just moving to Nashville for you, even though you're like 99.9% of the reason why. (laughs) But this is just, this, this risk is worth it. I think anything in life where you have to risk it all for, and you, you do it, you get a whole different experience. Like I just don't believe in mediocrity. 
I believe in love more than anybody that I know. And I believe that love is supposed to be extraordinary. I think it's supposed to get you through all the hardships in life. Love is like what makes our world go round. And Josh was worth the risk. And that's why I tell my story often is because you either resonate with the battle with cancer, you either resonate with our love story. There's something in the different layers of our story that people can relate to. And I just encourage people to, to take, take the risks, you know, especially when it comes to love, because there's nothing worse than mediocre love. It's not supposed to be that it's supposed to be extraordinary. And, you know, we had our fair share of ups and downs in the beginning, just like any relationship when you're trying to figure out how to mesh your lives together. So we always figure out a way to make it work. You know, we always figured out a way to meet in the middle and to respect each other. And that's what relationships are about. It's about choosing each other at the end of the day, despite, you know, the ups and downs that you may be dealing with. Because let's face it, relationships are hard and you have to put work in. And so moving out here was pretty wild. You know, I started a new job. I went from working in a treatment room to working in outside sales in a territory that I'd never lived in before while juggling my boyfriend at the time, you know, going through a cancer diagnosis, juggling a full-time job and going to chemo and radiation surgeries, you know, infections, more surgeries, you name it. And it just made me really grow as a person and prioritize my life and really the gift that Josh and I were given through all of this was waking up every morning and realizing what life is truly about and just having the perspective that none of us are promised tomorrow. So our love story really, aside from two months, had this incredible perspective that I wish to give to every single person that I come into contact with without having them have to go through the hard things that I've been through, which have led me to this perspective. Because you do, you stop worrying about the little things in life. You stop dwelling on just the trivial things and you focus on what really matters. And it allows you to just be a better, more kind, more understanding human being. And I think we're able to accomplish a lot more in our lives when we have that perspective that never die easy perspective, you know, like what if tomorrow doesn't come? Like, would I still be doing what I'm doing today? Would I still be working the same job? Would I still be, you know, holding grudges about silly things? It just, that perspective changes everything. So speed up two years and 25 days, you know, the length of time that Josh battled this disease. Here I am living my life with a pair of Josh Powell goggles on. And it's a gift to be able to live my life with the mindset that he had and to share that with other people so that they don't miss an opportunity in any day of their life to just live their life to the fullest and take time to check on the guy who has a flat tire on the side of the road or, you know, stop and talk to the homeless man standing on the corner that's always there at your exit every day, you know, and just connect with people. That's why we're here. Share your story. Make those connections. Don't judge a book by its cover. Give people chances. And yeah, sorry, that's like a crazy long-winded answer, but that's like our love story in a nutshell. I just, we went for it. He was diagnosed with cancer, looked at it as a bump in the road, never thought for a second that he was ever not going to beat it. And I cheered him on the entire way, never talked about the day that maybe cancer was going to take his life. We just lived. We lived a hell of a lot of life in two years and 25 days. And I wouldn't have it any other way other than him, of course, still being here. But that's something I don't have control over. What I have control over is making sure his legacy continues on because it's it helps so many people. Like it's just that, that mindset alone has helped so many people just staying positive, no matter what you're facing, choosing resilience in the face of adversity versus becoming a victim or giving your adversity power. You know, you are not cancer. You have cancer. 
I'm not like being a widow is not my whole existence. Like it's a part of my life. Sure. I lost my husband. It's horrible, but just like I'm sure cancer patients want to go through their life and not be pitied. You know, they want to be able to say I have cancer without somebody like looking at them with total defeat. It's the same thing when I tell people that my husband died, you know, I don't want to say it's the same thing. I hate comparing. That's just rude, but it's, it's a similar reaction, you know, and it's not like we talked about before. You're not sharing this because you want sympathy. It's just part of your reality, you know, and it's a piece of your story. It's not who you are. So I think being a caregiver sometimes is, is tough. You've got to hold all the pieces together, you know, and you want to be this stability for your loved one, but try and figure out how you can also care for yourself during all of this. So it's, it's a lot of, there's a lot of layers, but it's doable. For sure. We talk about intentionality a lot on the show and yeah. how facing certain crisis, you know, again, you're, you guys are young, like, and, and I was young when I had cancer as well too. And, and you're not supposed to think about what if I pass away when you're in your twenties and thirties, you know, you have so much life left to live. You're kind of getting started and figuring things out. You guys, you know, just fell in love and you were, you were nurturing a relationship and then all of a sudden you know, this bump in the road turns into something that's a little more serious as things progress. And you have to start thinking about those things when you're younger. And that's, you know, honestly, I think that's one of the main reasons I, I do this show is because, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to be old to die. I, I've had my mom tell me that so many times and it never really made sense until you're faced with the possibility of that happening to you. And it's a, it's a grim reality, but instead of looking at it in a negative way, I think it can really open up a ton of positivity and intentionality in your life with how you treat other people, how you treat yourself, the experiences that you have, because lots of times we hold back just because I think it's human nature to be a little selfish and hold things kind of close to the vest, but you know, have a, have a good friend, who has a foundation and it's called love as a verb, which, you know, love is action and the action of you expressing gratitude or any kind of extraordinary feelings towards each other or acts of service, any of the love languages out there, like it takes you to be selfless to do that. And it sounds like what you were talking about, like the, the kind of love that you guys had really exposed that probably the most between you guys and for the, all the people around you. So walk us through those moments where it started, started getting tough. Like maybe this bump in the road was going to be a little more than a bump in the road. Yeah. So Josh had a lot of setbacks when he was being treated here in Nashville. And so we decided when they, the surgeon had told him the only option that the only surgical option that he would give him to remove his synovial sarcoma from his lower abdomen was to amputate his right leg at his hip. So it would not be a functional leg. Like he wouldn't be able to live an active lifestyle. And that just wasn't Josh. I mean, if that was the only option, Josh would figure out a way, like he was already researching prosthetics and was figuring out a way to just cope with the idea of losing his leg and, um, you know, figuring out what life would look like and just preparing himself mentally for it. And that's when we decided to get a second opinion at MD Anderson in Houston. So we, we went there and his surgeon there had actually said, well, listen, I think I can do the exact same surgery, but save your leg. It's called an internal hemipelvectomy. And so she did. It was a 13 hour surgery. Um, she removed half of Josh's bladder. She removed part of his pelvis. She took muscle flaps from both of his thighs and used those to cover up the gaping hole in his abdomen once they removed the tumor that was the size of a volleyball, um, which called for a very long recovery. Josh was in the hospital for 10 weeks and to be honest, should have been there for a heck of a lot longer, but he <laughs> told his doctors, there's no way in heck that I'm staying in this hospital for one more day. So you're going to have to let me go home. So he drove back from Houston to Nashville with drains coming out of every limb in his body. And I 
nursed him back to health at home and it was the right move. He was better, much better at home. And it was just this mindset where this is where we finally get our next chapter, you know, our chapter without cancer and all the good is promised to us. And I remember reading that in one of Josh's journals, he had written that down. And so Josh, you know, gained some weight back, gained strength back in his legs where the muscles were removed. And in May, so surgery was in January of 2016. And in May, we flew back to California and went to our favorite beach in uh, Laguna. And he got down on one knee and asked me to marry him. Best day of my life by far aside from our wedding day. And it was only weeks after that where we had a follow-up at MD Anderson and we found out that his cancer had metastasized to his lungs. Luckily at that point we still had a couple options. There was an oral chemo, there was an oral chemo option and then one more infusion option. We tried both of those by August. We were told that neither of the options were working and that his cancer was spreading really really rapidly. So that was the hardest day of my life aside from the day that Josh passed because it was the reality that for me it was the reality that Josh was going to die. And I lost it. That was the first time that I'd ever lost it in a doctor's appointment or in front of Josh, quite frankly. Um, when it dealt with cancer, I mean, I lost it about work and other things, of course, <laughs> normal stressors of life. But um, yeah, that was a really, really hard day. And it was interesting because Josh just consoled me and comforted me and was like, babe, it's going to be fine. We'll figure this out. Like one should, our oncologist said, Josh isn't going to make it to your wedding in May of 2017. I don't have a crystal ball, but I doubt that he has six months left and you have to move your wedding date up. So we left that appointment and Josh said, let's just make our engagement party our new wedding date, which was November 12th because we already had friends flying in for it. So we did that. We planned our wedding in two months and we, Josh was in the ICU actually the week leading up to our wedding. He started having seizures and they were doing an EKG to try and figure out where those were coming from. And he almost didn't get released out of the hospital. We were just going to get married in the hospital, to be honest. Um, the day of our wedding, he got released on Friday. We got married on a Saturday. And the day of our wedding, he could barely get out of bed. Um, he showed up, though, <laughs> in true Josh fashion, like literally couldn't move and somehow mustered up the strength, got out of bed probably two hours after our wedding was supposed to start, got dressed up in his dress blues, got in his wheelchair, headed downtown, and made it to the altar to marry me. I mean, he's just, he was unbelievable, but he was a true army ranger. I mean, he like, if he gave you his word, he was going to be there. And he promised me that he was going to marry me that day at that venue. And he did. And it was the most beautiful two hours of our lives. And to be able to share that with our 50 people, you know, our, our closest people that were there from the beginning to the end um, was something that neither of us will ever forget and a memory that I will cherish for the rest of my life. Um, the days following, super, super, super tough. I mean, Josh declined really rapidly. So Josh passed away 31 days after we got married. And it was only maybe a week after our wedding that we were put into the palliative care unit in the hospital and then went home on in-home hospice, which only lasted a few days. The seizures started happening more frequently. And then we were transitioned into the actual hospice center where Josh lived for 10 days, 10 more days. And luckily got to watch army beat Navy for the first time in 14 years, which is honestly why I think he held on as long as he did because he just <laughs> had to be here for that. Um, which was incredible, but yeah, that stuff's heavy. It's, it's a really hard, um, that's where cancer is just so unfair. I mean, it's unfair every, every single day, but towards the end, it's, it's brutal. It's, it's, um, it's ugly. It's, it's something that I wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy. I mean, it's, 
it's a lot of suffering and it's painful for those who have to watch their loved one just slowly deteriorate. And like we were talking about before, it's like, that's when you feel like it's okay to go, you know, like you, you don't have to fight anymore. Like you, you don't have to suffer. Like nobody should suffer like that. Nobody should experience that kind of pain. And that's when it's almost, and this is kind of, painful to even say this out loud, but it's almost a relief to watch them take their last breath. And maybe I'll get flack for saying that, but you know, when you're watching your loved one who is no longer in the body of your loved one, you know, they're just skin and bones. And that's not who Josh was. That's not who Josh would ever want to be. And if he was going to be here like that, I think he would rather just transition over, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and be free of the pain and suffering and be Josh again, you know, be the 230 pound linebacker who just lived life on the edge, you know, and lived fast, rode his motorcycle, swore he was supposed to be a race car driver, jumped out of airplanes, you know, (laughs) like, towards the end that just, it wasn't him anymore. And, um, you know, he deserved to not have to suffer and not be in pain anymore. So I would give anything to have him back. I, he was my person, the love of my life, but it was no way to live, you know, the way that he was towards the end and what cancer did to him and his, his body. I mean, his mind was always strong and that's the hardest part is, to have your mind be so strong and just so with it and to have your body be failing you. It's, it's a pretty jacked up situation. So when most people get married, you, you get married thinking this is the rest of your life. You're going to spend this the rest of your life with this person, which in your case was kind of the same, but obviously the rest of your life had a timetable on it. Yeah. Um, how do you, I mean, kind of explain that to everyone listening today and myself included, like, how do you, this is going to sound terrible, but I don't mean it in a, in a bad way. How do you, how do you, how do you marry someone like knowing that, you know, you might not have much time left with them and I, and I understand why you did it, but like, you know, and how do you, I guess, how do you process that to me? Like I told, I totally get why you did it. I would do the same thing, but just like in your head, it's like, I'm, I'm doing this, but I know that there's a timetable left on this. Yeah. How do you kind of work through those emotions? Yeah. So like I said before, it's, it's interesting. Like Josh and I really never talked about that. We never talked about the timetable. We never talked about, even though it was being told to us, like Josh is not going to be living in May of 2017. Like that, I never really let that sink in and register because Josh always had something up his sleeve. Like we even went on and tried a clinical trial in California. Like you just never know. So we never really went there. And I think that's what helped us live the way that we did the entire time Josh had cancer, because the truth is we never let any of this information affect our future. We just kept living the way that we would if we knew we had forever. And which is why it's so important for me to share this story is because we all think that we have forever. We all think that we have time and, and we don't, we're not promised that. So getting married was a no brainer. I mean, I wanted to be married to Josh probably two months into our relationship, three months into our relationship. I knew that he was the one for me, which is why I fought for our, our love through everything that we went through. And same with him, you know, that's what a marriage is. To be honest, people are like, Oh my God, you were only married for a month. I was like, as soon as I decided to move halfway across the country for my boyfriend who had cancer, we were married, you know, like we didn't say our vows, but we lived our vows. There's many people who are married 50 years and don't live their vows, you know, like when you actually say those vows to your person, the love of your life standing across from you. We lived those, which is why our wedding was so powerful. 
in sickness and in health till death do us part. Like that was our entire relationship. There wasn't a day that that we weren't, you know, staying true to, to those vows. So to be able to finally say those to each other and to seal the deal and to not just have a wedding, to have a wedding, to have a party, but to solidify this marriage that we were basically already walking hand in hand in since we started this journey together was something that we both wanted and deserved, you know, even more so knowing that Josh didn't have a lot of time left. He deserved to transition over and to leave this, this life, a married man with a love that was untouchable, you know, and I deserved that, you know, we made such a commitment to one another and we, we cherished our love and there's just something so sacred about a marriage, you know, more so than just a wedding. So it was never a question for us. It wasn't like, do we do this? Do we not do this? I remember people in our close circle, like family members, actually, one in particular who was like, Josh doesn't need to be focused on a wedding or getting married. Like, he's sick. He needs to be getting better. And I'm like, looking at this person, like, are you hearing yourself? Like, Josh wants to get married. (laughs) Like Josh wants this wedding. Like don't rob him of that because he's sick or because you think that he should be focusing on, you know, eating a ketogenic diet instead of marrying the love of his life. You know, it's again, perspective and just respecting the wishes of your loved one who is sick and empowering them to conquer whatever it is that they want to accomplish, not holding them back. I think that's also a very important point because it's very easy to see someone that you love who is sick and be like, Oh, I really don't think you should play in that golf tournament. You know, I I think that it's just going to make things worse. You know, you might be really sore tomorrow and it's like, yeah, but this person's reality is the fact that they might not get another opportunity to play in a golf tournament. Like, So for me as a loved one, I'm like, heck yeah, play in that golf tournament, (laughs) you know, kick that golf tournament's butt, like show people that despite what you're facing, you can still do things that you love. You can still get out there and live, you know, and don't put things on hold. And that's for all of us. Don't put things on hold, just go and do. And I remember somebody telling me, Um, right after Josh passed away, I had mentioned having a bucket list because Josh and I started our MLB stadium bucket list when we were together. We did nine stadiums together in two years. And I knew that I would complete them in his honor once he passed away. And that helped me kind of have something to focus on as a new widow was living for both of us now, you know, not just for me, but for Josh, because he would give anything to be here and experiencing life and, checking um, things off his bucket list. He's a big bucket list guy and goal guy. Um, But I remember this Uber driver telling me, you're way too young to have a bucket list. And that just like hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, that's what's messed up though. Like, because people really think those thoughts, like you're too young. You're, you know, you're 29. What are you doing having a bucket list? I'm like, well, my 27 year old husband just died of cancer. So the truth is, you're never too young to start a bucket list. Like none of us are guaranteed time. So why are we putting off living? And most importantly, why do we put off our hopes and dreams last? You know, we're like, we need to do this first. We need to make this amount of money before we can do this. Like screw that mindset because that just isn't going to work. Like you figure out how to make the things happen that are most important to you because we're not promised tomorrow. And that's the mentality. That's that perspective. And that's living with intention. Like you had said, that's what life's about, you know, being intentional about everything that you do in your life. Every single morning you wake up, like start your day with intention. So your life has been a lot's happened, you know, again, for someone who's your age, right? So you've been through a lot of experiences, a lot of life, but you know, it's all 
kind of destined to, to get you to the point where you are now. Talk a little bit about the Josh Powell Foundation that you've created in honor of Josh. Yeah, I would love to. Um, so the Josh Powell Foundation, our mission is inspiring the world one battle at a time. And I kept the mission broad because I know its growth potential. And I didn't want to have to go about changing the mission statement. I wanted to keep it pretty solid. So what we focus on right now currently is empowering the minds of newly diagnosed sarcoma patients. So I started this program called the Powell Pack Program, which is implemented at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. And this program basically gifts every single newly diagnosed sarcoma patient that goes through treatment at MD Anderson, whether it be chemo, radiation, or surgery, on their first day of treatment, they receive this Powell Pack. It's a drawstring backpack. It's um, a journal, a notebook. It's a water bottle. It's a beanie. It's a keep going, never die easy wristband that Josh had designed while he was battling sarcoma, along with Josh's keep going statement. And the statement is basically Josh's explanation of what this wristband means to him and why he created it and why he started passing them out while he was battling sarcoma cancer. And all of these functional items that are in this Powell Pack have our keep, keep Going logo on it. And the whole idea behind it was I kind of looked back and thought about what were the items that Josh brought with him to chemo or radiation or surgery? What were things that he wouldn't leave the house with. One was his water bottle. One was his journal. And his journal was a gift. I mean, he had like probably 10 journals that he left behind with filled with just inspiring things that are such a gift to me. But I think that was part of a huge, a huge way that Josh kept his mindset so positive and so strong was by writing things down, by setting goals, by writing bucket lists, by you know, just writing down positive quotes that he can look at at, on a daily basis to remind himself to keep going. And the whole idea behind this Powell Pack is to gift these newly diagnosed patients with positivity, with encouragement, with inspiration, with motivation to keep going, beginning on their first day of treatment. And it goes back to that strong mind, strong outcome mentality. If we can instill that mindset that Josh had into the minds of these newly diagnosed patients and to be a platform, our social media platforms, our Instagram and our Facebook page, I post daily um, inspirational quotes on there. I post encouraging quotes on there. I post quotes of Josh. I pull other stories of sarcoma warriors who also have that same mindset and are just inspirations in this world. So we are a hub. We are a place where any cancer patient or anybody facing adversity for that matter can go to find positivity. There's no negativity. There's no negative anything. It's just strictly encouragement, motivation, inspiration, and positivity. And that's what we're here for where when you're just clawing, trying to get through the day and you need a little piece of motivation, that's us. And that's what the Powell Pack is, you know, going to chemo and looking down at your water bottle and seeing Josh Powell Foundation and realizing, yeah, chemo freaking sucks. I should not be having to go through this. But the alternative is not an option. You know, I have to keep going not only for me, but for those who have gone far too soon, who would give anything to be here to still be fighting. So that's where the Josh Powell Foundation was kind of born, just with that, that need and want to, to empower the minds of newly diagnosed patients, seeing firsthand how helpful that was in Josh's battle and just how helpful that is. I think that's the common denominator between all of these inspiring stories that you read of anybody facing adversity. It's choosing resilience, you know, and that gives you the motivation for you to keep going in your own life. And it's so important. And then also 
to be a platform to share other people's stories. So firsthand seeing how inspiring Josh has been and the legacy that he's left behind, I want to be that place for other people. You know, I want to be that platform to like what you're doing with this podcast. It's incredible, but I want to be that platform for other people who have similar stories. I mean, there's thousands of people in this world who have inspiring stories that need to be shared. And I want to shed light on those stories and I want to continue to inspire people, all walks of life, any type of adversity. And the common denominator is that mindset. And so that's, that's the Josh Powell foundation. I love it. I think that what you're doing is so amazing and it ties back into something we talked about earlier where you, you bring it all the way back to the moment where you guys first met. Yeah. You know, how, how rare is it to meet someone and then a couple months later, you know, you guys be in love and you've already moved across the country for someone. So something that strong has really carried into what you're doing now, even after the fact. I know it's we're coming up on two years since Josh has passed away and yeah. you know, this foundation is up and going strong and you just, I see all the events that you guys are hosting and the different things that, you know, you're, you're teaching and reminding people. And I, and I say that a lot. We, we either need to be taught or reminded how to do things. And your, your foundation, when you're, when these power packs, people are opening up, they may, they may need just to be reminded to have a little hope today, or yeah. they're going through all this. And, and, I, and I say this a lot as well too, is, you know, the, a lot of the doctors that we come in contact with their, their main goal is to give you the, the right treatment to get better. But that's only a portion of the whole journey. There's the emotional, there's the spiritual side, there's the financial side of this whole situation and all the things that you're doing are kind of touching on those other things that, you know, come along with the cancer diagnosis for someone, which I think is truly inspiring for what you did. You know, you're, your love for him has carried over into, you know, all of the things that you've done afterwards. And I think, you know, you're just a totally amazing and an inspirational person. And what you're doing is so selfless and it's creating so many opportunities for people. So on behalf of everybody that's, you know, experienced a power pack or who's heard your story, I just want to tell you, thank you for what you're doing because you know, the first time I saw it, I was, you can't, we can't watch your videos without um, a box of tissues around because not because it, it is sad, but it's powerful. And I think that's, you know, you know, I know, you know, no one wants sympathy. You don't want sympathy for anything like this, but that's, you know, you, you can't help but feel for the person who has lost, you know, someone they love so much, but the power of someone's life carrying on and the legacy that you've created for Josh, I think is so amazing and astounding that it just penetrates the hearts of people who watch the videos and who just feel so inspired by you sharing his message and his journey as you keep going along. So it takes a very special person to do that. So you, I'm sure you get, you know, you get reminded of that a lot, but if you don't, that's something you should think about. Like, and it's hard to take, if you're like me, it's hard to, to accept like positive things when people give yeah. you all sorts of accolades and stuff. You don't want to yeah. think about it because you know, it's, it's not, you're not doing it for that reason, but exactly. when people give you, you know, things, you know, so, you know, today I want you to go ahead and, you know, accept the fact that you're um, just truly amazing in what you're doing. And it's, it's, it's part of your life's mission. If it wasn't, then you wouldn't have been given the tools to do it. And you're just obeying, you know, what you've been instructed to do and you're doing it really well on, on top of that. Thank you so much. No, that it really does mean a lot when you're kind of trying to build something from the ground up and you have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> it is important to see how it's been able to impact people in a positive way because that, that encouragement and that reassurance is what gives me the the strength and the motivation to keep doing what I'm doing, you know, because a lot of times you don't know if it's helping, you don't know what kind of impact you're making unless people like you share, you know, and say, listen, like, thank you for sharing your story because it's been able to do this for my life or it's impacted me in a positive way. And these days where you feel like giving up and you have somebody reach out and say like, Hey, I received a pal pack. Can I get 50 wristbands to hand out to everybody um, 
you know, in my circle because they want to support me. It's like, oh, wow, this is doing what it's supposed to do. And I need to keep doing this. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for your encouragement and your thoughtful words. You're amazing as well. I'm so glad to be connected to you and to have been asked to share my story on your podcast. It's been an honor. I'd like to finish up each episode with a couple of quick facts about the person that I'm interviewing where people get a chance to get to know you a little bit. I know we've talked a lot about Josh today, but again, you're, you know, you're so valuable and so important. So I want to ask you a couple of quick questions. So our listeners can get a chance to to contact you, to reach out to you and we can get some information about how to to donate to the Josh Powell foundation as well. Yeah. I know you guys are available on Facebook, Instagram, yeah, um, Google plus as well too at Josh Powell foundation.org. Yes. But so to talk about you for a second. So now that, you know, you're, I know you're just starting a new job, you know, coming up, <laughs> life's kind of progressing on you're, and you're taking on different ways. Like yes. what is it that, uh, you know, I'd say motivates you each day now to, to keep pushing forward. You're taking a legacy of someone else along with you. So you're, you, you've got a burden, but it's yes. a good burden and you're carrying yes. it all along the way. And, and it's, you know, a part of your life story. Talk, like, tell us a little bit about what motivates you to, you know, create some new memories and, you know, how you, I guess, are motivated each day to live your life and, and carry this with you, but in a positive way where your, your life's going to keep going on. Yeah. You know, people ask me that often and it kind of, a lot of these answers are probably going to tie back to Josh just because it's such a huge part of my life. But, um, you know, after losing the most important person in my life, the one thing that has allowed me to be motivated to get out of bed in the morning, to keep setting goals, to keep dreaming, to keep living the unthinkable, accomplishing the unthinkable is for not only me, but it's for Josh too. I mean, I look, look at Josh and how he lived his life. And I'm like, a lot of times I find myself asking myself, um, what would Josh do in this situation? You know, because he was such an inspiration in my life and he, without a shadow of a doubt, wants me to be happy and would not want me to be suffering at all. And whatever that looks like, he would want me to do it. So in a work instance, I'll ask myself, what would Josh do from a JPF perspective? Same thing. From a friend perspective, I mean, I just really valued his opinion and I valued the ability um, that he had to guide my life in a just positive way and just always encourage me, whether it was in work, in friendships, in life. And so I just, nothing's really changed other than he's not right next to me and he is kind of orchestrating my life in the craziest way. But, but that's really it. And I think, um, that's a reminder that I give to people all the time is don't only live for yourself, but live for the people who no longer get to be here. You know, I have people that I've connected with who have lost loved ones. Maybe it's a parent or a best friend or a spouse. And the last thing that they would want you to do is to be curled up in a ball every day crying. You know, they, they don't get to be here anymore. They don't get to live another day. So I think that's where that intention comes back into play is like waking up and realizing that today is a gift. Not all of us get to have. And what am I going to do with it? You know, what kind of mark am I going to leave on this world today? And that's what gets me out of bed every morning. So you mentioned something earlier about bucket lists. What's, what are a couple of items that you have on your bucket list going forward? Yeah. So I just completed stadium number 30, which was mine and Josh's bucket list. But moving forward, I really, really more than anything want to see the Northern lights. <laughs> that's always been on my bucket list. Um, so that's going to be happening in the near future. I'm either going to do probably next November. That's what I'm going to do. Um, uh, maybe for third wedding anniversary. Um, that is on there. I also want to do all 50 states. I'm at about 30 right now. So I definitely plan on completing all 50 states in the next couple of years. 
Um, national parks are a big one for me. I love being out in nature. That's been very therapeutic for me. Um, so I did Glacier. I did Denali. I was just in Alaska with my mom. So we did that. And so that's, I mean, there's a lot. So that one's a little overwhelming, but I'm definitely, whenever I'm finishing up those 50 states, if there's a national park, I'll make sure to hit one of those. But that's at the forefront of my bucket list right now. Those are like the top three things. I'm sure there's other stuff that will will come into play um, eventually. But yeah, those are probably top three. If someone wants to donate to the Josh Powell Foundation, what's the easiest way they can do that? Yeah, the easiest way to donate to JPF is you're actually just going to go to the website which is being revamped, but the old version works. It's at www.joshpowellfoundation.org. And there's also a donate button on our Facebook page. Um, so you can, you can donate through Facebook as well. And it's just Josh Powell Foundation, same thing on um, Instagram. But yeah, the, the best, easiest way to donate would be through the website. And if someone wants to reach out to you personally, um, is there a certain email through the website that you would like to share with yeah. them? Yeah. So all the emails, I'm a one man show. So all the emails that are received through the website go directly to me. Um, so you can either email through the website or you could just email through your whatever email server you have. Um, it's Josh Powell foundation at gmail.com. Well, Fabi, I've really enjoyed our time today. Just listen to you talk. It's, it's changing the rest of my day today for sure. As I, as I go forward and all the things I have to accomplish the rest of the day, I'm taking a little piece of your story with me as I walk, continue to walk through the rest of the day. And I'm think all the listeners today that, that have heard your story can take a piece of this puzzle and apply it to their life and really take a lot of inspiration and a lot of hope. And a lot of the things that you've said today about, you know, just holding on until the last minute because you never know when things are going to come. But if they don't, then you're going to be okay. Just continue to be intentional about your life. Do all the things that you wanted to do. Love as much as you possibly can. Share as much. Do as much for other people as you can because we're all in this together. So, Fabi, again, I thank you for being a guest on the show. And thank you for adding 1% to the people that are listening today. No, thank you so much for having me. And just like one final thought, and this is for anybody who's experienced anything painful in their life. I think if you just can find purpose within your pain, you're going to leave a mark on this world and you're going to help a lot of people. So just focus on that rather than how painful your experience is. Just find the purpose behind it. And I think you're going to be okay. Awesome. Thanks, Bobby. We appreciate it. Thanks. You're the best. I look forward to speaking with you again soon. I hope that these viewers are inspired and I hope my story helps somebody out there. We appreciate you spending time with us on today's episode and encourage you to continue the conversation to help you keep pushing forward. For more resources based on today's episode, as well as ways to recommend a guest and connect to Truett personally, head over to 1percentpodcast.com. Be sure to join us next time for more stories of inspiration right here with Truett Taylor on the 1% Podcast. Podcast.